Okay. Is it an established principle that any case where there is betrothal and there is no transgression, the offspring invariably follows the male? But there is the case of a convert who married a mom Zaret, convert, where there is a, a valid betrothal and there is no transgression, as they are permitted to marry each other, and yet the offspring follows the flawed lineage and is a momzer. So are they following the, the lineage of the momzer or the convert? The moms are the, 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 the moms are at, it's the mother, but the moms are at. What if the moms are at is actually Jewish though? Like what if she had two Jewish oh, parents? The, the, the moms are at is Jewish. She's just got faulty lineage or faulty lineage. Uh -huh. Um, and the convert is also Jewish, but a convert. Yeah. As it is taught in a Baraita, with regard to a convert who married a mom's Zaret, the offspring is a mom's there. This is the statement of Rabbi Yosei. Rabbi Yochanan said to Rabbi Shimon, do you maintain that the Mishnah is in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yosei? Not so. The Mishnah is in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, who says a convert may not marry a mamzeret, and therefore, in this case, there is betrothal and there is a transgression, which is why the offspring follows the flawed lineage. The Gemara asks, but if so, let the Mishnah teach this case as one of its examples. The Gemara answers the Mishnah taught the principle, any case where there is a betrothal and transgression in the latter clause, precisely to include this kind of case. There is a guiding principle of the Gemara's interpretation of the Mishnah that the Mishnah does not include extraneous phrases. Every apparently superfluous phrase is a context in the context of a principle serves to include or exclude a certain case from the principle. This is the basis of the discussion that the Gemara here has below. Here and below. If you wish, and if you wish, say a different answer. Actually, the Mishnah is in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yosei, and it taught the phrase, in which case is this applicable, to exclude cases of betrothal without a transgression other than those listed in the Mishnah. The offspring follows the lineage of the father only in those cases specified by the Mishnah. Okay, so very specific cases. Yeah. The Gemara asks, but does the list that follows the, uh, does the list that follows the phrase, in which case is this applicable, including all applicable cases? And are there no more? But there's the example of a halal who married an Israelite woman where there is a betrothal and there is no transgression, and yet the offspring follows the male as he too is a halal. The Gemara rejects this claim. This is not difficult, as one can say that the Tana of the Mishnah holds in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Dotse ben Rabbi Yehuda, who maintains that the offspring of this union is entirely fit. Yeah, because he married a woman, and the, the we talked about that the woman has the power to remove whatever, like, to purify the, the children or something. Oh, yes, he did. She does have the power to purify a halal. I forgot that, yes. The Gemara asks, but there is the case of an Israelite who married a halala, where there is a betrothal. Does this mean a female priest who is now not a priest? No, the daughter of uh, 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 the daughter oh, of a priest from a from a forbidden priestly relationship. Okay, uh, where there is a betrothal and there is no transgression, and the offspring follows the male, and yet this case is not mentioned in the Mishnah. The Gemara responds. The Mishnah taught the principle, any case where there is betrothal and no transgression in the first clause to include this situation. I don't remember what the first clause was anymore. Neither do I, but it wasn't the second clause. <laughs> yeah. The Gemara asks, but let the Tana of the Mishnah teach explicitly this example of an Israelite woman, an Israelite who married a Halala. The Gemara answers, he did not do so because he cannot teach it. Uh-oh. <laughs> the Torah cannot mention this halacha. A brief as part of the list. The Gemara clarifies its answer. How can the Tana teach it? Uh, he cannot state a daughter of a priest and a daughter of a Levite and a daughter of an Israelite and a Halala who married a priest, a Levite, and an Israelite, as is a Halala fit for a priest. The marriage involves a transgression. Consequently, the sentence of the Mishnah cannot be constructed so as to include a Halala. So simply because we can't mention all of these people all the time, that's what they're saying? Um, no, it's because a halala is not fit for a priest. Okay. It never is. Like, that's a transgression. So they can't say there is no transgression if that's a transgression, is what they're trying to say. But they never mentioned that the person was a priest before. They just said an Israelite who married a halala. Oh, you're so right. He did so because he cannot teach it. The Tana cannot mention this halakha. A daughter of a priest. 
and a daughter of a Levite and a daughter of Ezra. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe they just can't say so many things. They're just like, they, the yeah. Gemara can't say things. They just can't be that specific all the time. Except that's what they do in the entire Talmud is get really specific. The yeah. Gemara asks, but there is also the Halakha of Rabbi Bar Barhana. As Rabbi Bar Barhana says, that Rabbi Yochanan says, with regard to a second generation Egyptian man, i.e. the son of an Egyptian convert, who married a first generation Egyptian woman, a woman who herself converted, her son considered a third generation Egyptian who may marry a Jew of unflawed lineage. This is an example of a betrothal without a transgression where the offspring follows the father. So they're Jewish. It's just that the father was the younger generated. Well, no, the mother is a first generation. Right. So it, it follows the father. Because there's a betrothal without the without the transgression where the offer, offspring follows the father. Okay. The way it's like normally. The Gemara answers the Mishnah taught the principle. Any case where there's a betrothal and no transgression in the first clause to include this example. The Gemara adds, and according to the opinion of Rav Dimi, who said that this son is a second generation Egyptian, the Mishnah taught, in which case is this acceptable? At its beginning, with regard to the betrothal, that does not involve a transgression to exclude this case. Rav Dimi maintains that this son may not marry a Jew of unflawed lineage. So they're talking about whether this works. Yeah. So. The Gemara asks, but there is the following case, which apparently contradicts the principle of the Mishnah. As when Ravin came from Eretz Yisrael, he said that Rabbi Yochanan says, with regard to the nations, i.e. if members of two different nations married when they were Gentiles, follow the male to determine the status of their child. This is the case whether he is a regular Gentile who may marry a Jew of unflawed lineage as soon as he converts, or whether he is an Ammonite or an Egyptian who may not marry a Jewish woman of unflawed lineage. In either case, the child's status follows that of the father. He may not marry a Jewish woman of unflawed, he has to have a, a Jewish woman of flawed lineage if he wants to marry. I guess. I guess before he converts. Okay. Oh, I think it's after he converts. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Honestly, fair. I'm, I'm going to say it. Sounds like racism to me. <laughs> it does. It doesn't <laughs> sound fair. Okay. <laughs> if these members of two different nations converted, follow the flawed lineage of the two. These converts are permitted to marry one another and their betrothal is effective. If either the father or the mother is Egyptian, the child follows the parent with the flawed lineage and would be Egyptian. Why is that considered flawed lineage? I don't like this. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas according to the principle stated in the Mishnah, one should follow the male. The Gemara answered, the Mishnah taught in which case is this applicable? In the first clause to exclude this case. They keep saying this first clause, but like, I don't know what they mean. Are they talking about the father or the mother? Or like, I don't know what this... It's back up there. We can go up and scroll up if we want to. Yeah, I don't really care. Okay, no worries. Yeah. So, even if they both convert, they're still flawed? That's what it seems to be saying. Well, yeah, then, no, that, that, I guess, conversion is considered flawed lineage. <sighs> okay. Yeah, exactly. Sounds racist. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, let me, let me back that up, because this is going to go on the internet, so I want to say it this way. Um, I'm sure that when they're saying flawed, they don't mean flawed like that, um, but, uh, but also, I think that it means it's not, like, pure enough for a priest. Yeah, if that's all they're talking about is priesthood. But I think we began this with talking about laws of inheritance or something. Yeah. So that's why... I, I mean, think... the whole thing is Kiddushin, so this is holiness laws. Like, these are holiness codes. Okay. Okay. The Gemara returns to an earlier point. What is this claim? That the Mishnah is in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yose? Granted, if you say that the mission is in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, one can explain that the phrase "any case" of the first clause serves to include an Israelite woman who married a halal, uh, sorry, an Israelite who married a halala, as the child follows the father in that case too, and also to include the ruling of Rabbi Bar Bar Hana that the son of a second generation Egyptian who married a first generation Egyptian woman is a third generation Egyptian. Furthermore, the expression I think I remember where this goes, um, in which. Uh, Furthermore, the expression, in which case is this applicable, serves to exclude the ruling of Rav Dimi that her son is a second generation Egyptian and the statement of Rav, and the statement of Rav inciting Rav Yochanan. 
what I remember amid this is that there's something that says in Torah, they shall be cursed unto the third generation. Yeah. And I can't remember what that's about, but I'm wondering if that's because of Egyptian enslavement. And so like when we were slaves in Egypt, so I'm wondering if that is where this cursed into the third generation comes from. I think that was somewhere in Leviticus. Yeah. Just about if you do this bad, then this is your punishment and that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't, it's hard to keep track of, but maybe if you were looking at the Talmud page, like it's easy, you would be able to just flick your eyes over to be like, oh, that was what Rabbi Yochanan said. And yeah. Like, I, I already forgot what Rabbi Yehuda said versus Rabbi Barhana or whatever. I want to make an Excel spreadsheet that just has all of their like opinions. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's, that's the way it would look, but just have it all in yeah. English. <laughs> what if I did it? Hold on. I'm sure someone's done it. I'm sure. We should find it. Okay. If not, I'll do it starting next time. Okay. And the phrase, any case of the latter clause, which is referring to betrothal with a transgress. Oh, this was, oh, this, the two clauses are betrothal where there is transgression, betrothal where there's not transgression. Like, I think those are the, the, the yes. key. Yes, that's what it must The be. latter clause, which is referring to betrothal with a transgression, yes. serves to include a convert who married a mom Zeret. But if you say that the Mishnah is in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yose, then granted the phrase, any case where there is betrothal and no transgression of the first clause is, as we said, it includes an Israelite who married a halala, and the phrase, in which case is this applicable, is as we said, i.e. to the exclusion of Ravin or Rav Dimi, and the case of the convert who married a mom Zeret. But there's, I don't know, they, they just, it's so legal that I'm like, what's their actual answer? But what does the phrase, any case of the latter clause serve to add? So yeah, a convert who marries a mom Zeret is betrothal with transgression because the person is still a mom Zeret, even if they're Jewish. Okay. Um, the Gemara responds, and according to your reasoning, the same question applies to Rabbi Yehuda as well. Why do I need the phrase, in which case is this applicable of the latter clause? Rather, you must say, since the Mishnah taught its first clause using the phrase, in which case is this applicable, it also taught its latter clause using the phrase, in which case is this applicable, merely for the sake of stylistic consistency. So too here, with regard to Rabbi Yosei's opinion, one can say, since the Mishnah taught the first clause with an expression, any case, it also taught the latter clause with any case. Well, that's nice of them to be like equal in this. They're like, it's gotta be poet. Yeah. Even if I still don't really understand what their full, their final answer was, the Gemara discusses the aforementioned matter itself. When Ravin came from Eretz Yisrael, he said that Rabbi Yochanan says, with regard to the nations, if members of two different nations married when they were Gentiles, follow the male to determine the status of their child. If they converted before marriage, follow the flawed lineage of the two. What if neither of them is flawed? Yeah. But they're just going with the, like the most flawed. Then they just go with the, the male. analyzes a statement. What is the meaning of with regard to the nations follow the male? As it is taught in Nebraita, from where is it derived with regard to one member of the nations outside Eretz Israel who engaged in intercourse with a Canaanite woman and fathered a son from her that you are permitted to purchase the son as a slave as he is not considered a member of the Canaanite nations um, who are not allowed to live in Eretz Israel. You engaged in intercourse with a Canaanite woman and fathered a son and your son is your slave now? yeah wow okay yeah. <laughs> i mean people did that in the, like you know, the uh, war time whatever <laughs> the verse states and also of the children of the residents who sojourn with you of them you may buy which indicates that there is a way in which one may purchase slaves from the inhabitants of canaan one might have thought that even with regard to a Canaanite slave who engaged in intercourse with a maidservant from the other nations and fathered a son, that you are permitted to buy the son as a slave. So this time it's not your son, it's the, it's, the, it's, the slave had sex with somebody else entirely yeah, of another nation. Therefore, the verse states, which they have begotten in your land. This means that one may purchase from those who are merely begotten in your land. The, whose fathers are not from the Canaanite nations, but not from those who reside in your land, whose fathers are from the seven Canaanite nations. So you can both have Canaanite slaves and non-Canaanite slaves is what they're saying. No, you can't, you can't have a Canaanite slave. You can have the son of a Canaanite 
as a slave. Because Canaanites are them not them? permitted to live in the land with you. Yeah, they, like, killed them all, apparently. Yeah, but, like, historically, that's not what happened. I know, like, but that, if you want to go with, the, with the story, like, then, yeah. the, I don't know, they probably really believe that at this Talmudic time. Yeah. <laughs> the Gemara discusses the second clause of Rabbi Yochanan's statement. If they converted, follow the flawed lineage of the two. To which case does this refer? If we say that is referring to an Egyptian man who married an Ammonite woman, what flawed lineage is there? The lineage of an Ammonite woman who converts is not flawed at all, as the sages expounded in the verse, an Ammonite shall not enter into an assembly of the Lord, is referring to an Ammonite man, but not an Ammonite woman. A win for the Am Ammonite woman, <laughs> <laughs> which means that she can marry a Jew of unflawed lineage. Yeah. Is, is that a win for her? The Ammonite shall not is referring so only the men can't enter okay well too bad for them rather <laughs> it, it must be referring to an ammonite man who married an egyptian woman and if that case if and in that case if the child is a male cast him after his father and render him permanently prohibited from entering the congregation as an ammonite male and if the child born to them is a female cast her after the mother so that she is considered a second generation Egyptian who may not marry a Jew of unflawed lineage. But can not marry a Jew of Jew. flawed lineage. So the the like first, like the zero generation Ammonite woman can marry a Jew of Yeah, the, the um, Ammonite woman can marry anyone she wants because she's not a flawed lineage. But an Ammonite man is considered of flood lineage and can't and and oh this is a child wait well i mean they're always going to be they, like the ammonite woman will always be a child of an ammonite for the most part man so yeah like, but but that's if they convert like how long do we have to hold on to, have to convert first yeah uh okay oh yeah the ammonite woman who converts but if you have just a man and a woman that never convert and they have a child and that child is a second generation Egyptian. Okay. I guess. Yeah. Cause here they never converted, but yet the child is allowed to marry a Jew of unflawed lineage. Okay. Whatever. The Mishnah teaches that in any case where a woman cannot join in betrothal with him, but she can join in betrothal with others, the offspring is a mom's heir. The Gemara explains from where do these matters derive, as Rabbi Chia bar Abba says and that Rabbi Yochanan says, and some determined that it was in the name of Rabbi Yanai, and Rav Acha, son of Rava, determined that it was said in the name of Rabbi Yose, uh, Yose ha Hagalili. The verse states, wow, that's a lot of people that they just decided. Um, <laughs> the verse states, with regard to a divorced woman, and she departs out of his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. This teaches that she can become the wife of others, but not of relatives. Betrothal to forbidden relatives does not take effect. I do like, because they're, they're like, this is really important to be like, um, this many people said this was true. And like, we, we got to make sure we, we name drop all the people. So Yeah, well, my favorite is that like, this person says that this other person said that too. So like, we need to drop them too. Like anybody yeah. who potentially may have thought this. But it's, it's like, the, the more people they name, the more true it must be, I guess. Yeah. The verse states with regard to it, yeah. Rabbi Abba objects to this after all those people. But <laughs> one can say and explain that the term another in the verse indicates, but not to her husband's son. Betrugal is ineffective only in the case of a prohibition that warrants court imposed capital punishment, not one that warrants current. Okay. Gemara rejects this suggestion with regard to a. Right. With regard to a son, it is explicitly written, a man shall not take his father's wife. That's true. That's in Deuteronomy. Uh-huh. Which means that betrothal is ineffective in this situation. If so, why do I need the emphasis of the term another? Learn from this term that she may marry others, but not relatives. So Rabbah thought that it just referred to the son, and then the Gemara said no. Yeah. It's all of the relatives. All the other relatives. The Gemara challenges this explanation. But one can say that both this verse and that verse are referring to a son, and yet both are necessary to this verse. Shall not take is referring to the Chalach uh, Ab, Ab, Ab Nishio, 
Um, it does not mean that the betrothal is ineffective, but merely that one may not marry his father's wife. And that verse, and becomes another man's wife, teaches that even after the fact, if the son attempted to betroth his father's wife, his act is of no consequence. Why would they even need to mention that? The Gemara responds, one learns that betrothal is ineffective in this case ab initio from a different source, as it is derived from the prohibition prescribing a wife's sister by the following a fortiori inference. If with regard to the prohibition prescribing a wife's sister, whose transgression is punished with karet, she cannot be betrothed by her sister's husband, in accordance with the verse, and you shall not take a woman with her, her sister, then with regard to cases that entail liability to receive court-imposed capital punishment, and of course with one's father's wife, is it not all the more so the case the betrothal does not fit? So, okay, what am I saying? Um, <laughs> Basically, the situation is, is it a transgression or was it never effective to begin with? One learns the betrothal is ineffective, in this case, ab initio, from the, oh, from the very beginning. Yeah. Is, a wife's sister maybe you can take that sister after your wife is dead or something or you're fully divorced but you can't no, you can't this. you can never take the wife's sister that's what i because i think that's what we talked about earlier a couple um a couple like pages ago oh about the relatives and stuff yeah okay um, I, don't know, I can't name all the people who i think said that though, i know so. could be wrong <laughs> <laughs> I know. Okay, whatever. The Gemara suggests another interpretation of this verse. But as the verse has already prohibited betrothal to a wife's sister, one can say as follows, both this verse you shall not take and that one become another man's wife are referring to the wife's sister. As this one you shall not take prohibits the relationship ab initio, where that verse, another man's wife, teaches that the betrothal is of no effect even after the fact. The Gemara responds, yes, it is indeed so. Good. The verse should be interpreted in this manner. So, so basically they're both referring to there's no possible way even after the fact um it was it was prohibited beforehand but also after the fact still prohibited yes the, I was was sure, yeah, like the the wife sister was always not allowed and unless you didn't marry the wife in the very beginning yeah and then another man's wife that could be anyone it's a win for common decency <laughs> i think so Gamara asks, we found a source from the prohibition prescribing a wife's sister. From where do we derive that betrothal is also ineffective for the other forbidden relations? The Gamara answers, we derive it from the case of a wife's sister by means of the following analogy. Just as the prohibition with regard to a wife's sister, which is specified by the Torah, is a prohibition of a forbidden relative that is punished with karet for its intentional transgression and requires a sin offering for its unwitting transgression, and betrothal is ineffective in this case, so too with regard to any prohibition that involves a foreign relative whose intentional transgression is punished with karet, and whose unwitting transgression renders one liable to bring a sin offering, betrothal is likewise ineffective in those cases. So they're just extrapolating. Karet is stoning? What is karet? No, karet is being cut off from the... Oh, oh right, okay. I am thinking as we talk about this. What are you thinking about? Well, my favorite is anytime we talk about like how a man is not allowed to marry his sister's wife. Uh, I'm sorry, his wife's sister. Um, also, presumably not his sister's wife, but that's not mentioned. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but Jacob married Rachel and Leah fully. Like that happened. That was before these laws were put, but that happened. And then you have a lot of people sort of afterwards that still make excuses for those kinds of things. You have a lot of like polygamous people that make excuses for these kinds of things and say that it's fine. Um, but this was a huge sticking point in the marriage of uh, uh, the first, it's Catherine and Henry VIII. Um, because he was married to, uh, she was married to his brother first and then he died and then she married him. And it's a huge sticking point. It's actually one of the reasons he asked the church for a divorce um, and was not able to get one in the Catholic church. Um, but uh, he then wound up getting one in the Catholic church. He was able to, to get it. And then Anne Boleyn started a whole new church. And that, my friends, is my random history that I know about King Henry VIII. <laughs> Six. 
<laughs> from um, six weeks ago. <laughs> but wouldn't in that case she be passed on to him in like the case of um oh you're right that's not his wife's right sister at all that's that's the halitza situation yeah totally wow i got very confused thank you jordan yeah because then it's like what if she gave the brother no children okay now she has to go on to the next brother so yeah this is the opposite you're right it's it's actually the opposite it's 100 the opposite <laughs> cool but it's not the opposite with jacob rachel and leia i was still correct that's about true that. although yeah i mean i guess the only thing you can say is like the laws weren't made yet they didn't have torah well the laws weren't made yet they didn't have torah and maybe it's because of that relationship because these laws got put in yeah just, you know just like fdr doing four terms and then people were like never mind we should probably limit a president from having multiple terms <laughs> like that. that anymore fdr all right Nobody thought they needed that law until it became necessary. Yeah, that's true. It's like some of the yeah. dumb laws, like the in the game Balderdash, <laughs> that you can oh, yeah. get, where it's like, don't park your horse on Sundays on a on a lamp post, and it's like, okay, somebody had to have done this for this to have become a law. Yeah, why did we make this a law? Um, it's my turn. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The Gemara asks. Granted, virtually all other forbidden relatives can be derived in this manner, but the case of a married woman and a brother's wife are exceptions, and the analogy in these cases can be refuted as follows. What is unique about a wife's sister is that she is not permitted in the case of a mitzvah. Even where the mitzvah of the Leverett marriage would apply, one may still not marry one's wife's sister. Um, will you say with the same regard to a brother's wife who is permitted in the case of a mitzvah of Leverett Leverett marriage. A brother's wife is permitted in the case of the mitzvah of Leverett marriage. So this is this was exactly the question that I just had. Yeah. Awesome. I love she when I'm wife. psychic. She was permitted in the case of Leverett. With regard to a married woman, the interpretation can likewise be refuted. What is unique about these cases of a wife's sister and a brother's wife is that they cannot be permitted during the lives of those whose existence renders them prohibited, as neither a wife's sister nor a brother's wife can be permitted while the person who causes the prohibition is alive. This caveat is added because one's wife's sister does not does become permitted once his wife has died. Oh. Uh, his wife. So now the the wife's oh. sister is available. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so she's wow. not always proscribed the whole time. Um, will you say the same with regard to a married woman who can become permitted during the life of the one who renders her forbidden by means of a divor divorce? Oh, that's a question. That's a good question. <clears throat> Rather, this halakha, that betrothal is ineffective for uh, for other forbidden relatives, is derived from a different source. As Rabbi Yona says, and some say, this was taught by Rav Huna, uh, sorry, Rav Huna, son of Rav Yehoshua, the verse states explicitly in the chapter dealing with forbidden relationships, whoever shall do any of these abominations shall be cut off. <laughs> I don't like that verse. Um, in this verse, all those with whom relations are forbidden are juxtaposed to one another and therefore also to a wife's sister. Just as betrothal is not effective in the case of a wife's sister, so too betrothal is not effective with regard to all those with whom relations are forbidden. This whole thought that betrothal is further forbidden. That's actually a really cool way of going about this. So they were, they were trying to find a different source. Okay. Yes, but here's a really interesting way of going about this. This is something, maybe I'm wrong, but this is something that I've seen Talmud do a couple of times where they take something that would require you to be cut off from your community. And instead of saying, doing it requires you to be cut off, they say it was never effective to begin with. Well, that's just like the the uh, wayward son. Like they come up with all those, what is, what is wayward? At what age is he wayward or rebellious or whatever? Yeah, exactly. They come up with all of these ways to not have to cut off, deal with all of that stuff. Like it's, it's a really kind of interesting and awesome act that shows that I think even the sages had issues with these things. What do you, but like, what do you see in here that, that you see them doing that? Well, because they're saying that it was never effective to begin with. So if the relationships are forbidden and the betrothal is never effective, then you can't ever have the relationship. So, so if it's a relationship, if that specific relationship would cause you to be cut off, they say that you couldn't have ever possibly had the relationship because betrothal would be ineffective in that case. So you never had the relationship. Now, you can still- Betrothal is, well, but you can still fall in love, but like you can never be yeah. betrothed. Right, you can never be betrothed. Um, you can still fall in love, you could still do things, but if so you're not- it. And there, Because you can never be betrothed, 
there's like no way that you can get in trouble for it. There will be no flawed, unflawed Jew. There will be no... what I think. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure that that's where they're going with that. They probably aren't going there with that, but I think it's a cool place to go with that. Yeah, I think because that's, that's the end right now. Yeah. Oh. Tamara asks, if so, that this halakha is derived from here. Why do they do that all the time? What? Why do they end with like one sentence going on to the next page? Um, Because it's a continuous thing. The dafiomi is a continuous thing. You should always be waiting for the next one. You should be excited for the next one. Oh, they really do set it up that way. They really do. It's like a cliffhanger. cliffhangers. <laughs> Talmudic cliffhangers. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>